Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate you being here this morning. 296 will be our first song. 296. We have come into his house. Hey, Brian. Let's all sing. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in celebrating our October birthdays following our service this evening so remember that on October the 25th which will be Wednesday evening we'll be having a trunk or treat we will have a meal uh, some soups and chilies and things like that before our Wednesday evening service that'll begin at 5 30 so make your plans to be a part of that October the 28th this coming Saturday will be our men's breakfast so men remember that at seven o'clock October the 29th and following our evening service we'll have a men's meeting so remember all of these things that you have uh, that we have coming up we also want to remember all of these that you see on the prayer list uh, you see some of those behind me if you a more extensive list is in our bulletin if you'll get that and make sure that you have all of those a couple of announcements that uh, I don't usually have my phone up here but I have this on uh, some of these things on my phone so I'm gonna make sure that I get those right um, First Louise would like to uh, request prayer. She has been diagnosed with a serious lung disease. It is called pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, she will be going to UAB on the 17th of November to get some additional testing done. So uh, she's trying to see the extent of that, uh, that lung damage to see what's going on there. Um, she solicits your prayers, of course, but the end of her text says, God has me on this. So uh, let's remember Louise in your prayers as, as we always are a praying congregation. Thank you for, for those things. Also an update, if you've got your, uh, your Remind app going, uh, you, you learned that uh, Brett and Olivia did uh, have their baby, Ellie Lane. Uh, she had that, uh, maybe that was Thursday night. I believe that is correct. She, is, uh, she was born, came out crying, uh, so they were uh, taking that as a, uh, a, a big win. Uh, you know that she has uh, issues we've been dealing with. She talked about that she has the uh, skeletal dysplasia, among some other things like dwarfism and things like that that they've been dealing with. Uh, so they wasn't sure what to expect, but uh, she has she was on a ventilator and she has gone down to 72 percent, and she is maintaining that uh, as stable at this point. They're still watching uh, blood pressure and uh, some other things, but uh, again, she is stable at this point, and they wasn't sure what to expect, and they got to meet their their little daughter. So uh, blessings uh, all around for that. Continue to remember this young family, if you would. Brett, Olivia, and her the baby's name is Ellie Lane. So please continue to remember them. She still has a long road, but uh, please remember them in your prayers. If there are others or updates or something like that that we need to uh, make, please let us know. We'll get those 
those things announced for you. Andy's mom goes in this week. I'm sorry? Andy's mom goes in this week. For Andy's mom goes in this week for surgery? Surgery. No. Also, uh, apparently we were going to be in the car this morning that uh, the Danny's uncle passed away. Okay, pray for the Wilburn family. They learned this morning that Danny's uncle passed away as well. So remember that. Our next song, number 877. Won't it be wonderful there? Amen. I want to sing all three verses of this song. Let's sing. When with the Savior we enter the glory land, won't it be wonderful? Seven through nine. 
He who corrects a scoffer shall shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hates you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Give instructions to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to come and be able to gather together in your name, focus our minds on you and worship you, help us to do so in the right way, to clear our minds of the things of the earth and all the stuff that fills our life that is not you. And help us to be encouraged by the songs that we sing to you and to give praise to you in the right way to take the Lord's Supper uh, and to be able to focus on what your son has done and continues to do in our lives and to leave this place better than we came. Please be with those that have been mentioned, that are hurting, that are sick, that are suffering, that are lonely, and help us to be selfless enough to consider others, to treat them the way that we would want to be treated, and to give you all the glory for all that is yours. Help us as we go throughout the rest of this service, and we ask all these things, whatever is your will, in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we prepare our minds for taking the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing number 385, Robe of Calvary, 385. <clears throat>
Lord's Day, we as Christians gather around the Lord's table. We do this out of command. We are commanded to do this, not by tradition. And we are commanded by the very one that we will commemorate his life, burial, and resurrection today at this very time. The front of this table says, do this in remembrance of me. Those are his words. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come around your table to partake of this bread, which to us as Christians represents your son's body as it hung on the cross between heaven and earth. We thank you, Father, and we pray that as we do this, we do so in a manner that is pleasing to you. For we pray in his name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Again, let's go to God in prayer, please. Father, again, we gather around your table this time to partake of the fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents your son's shed blood on the cross for the remission of our sins. We know and believe that this is the only blood that can do that, his blood. And we pray, Father, as we do this, we do so in a manner that is well-pleasing in your sight. For in his name we pray, Jesus the Christ. Amen. concludes the Lord's Supper and we find this a convenient time to remind ourselves uh, not that you need it but we need to be reminded from time to time that um, God has given us so much he has blessed us beyond belief and we have an opportunity right now actually to return a portion of which he has so richly blessed us let's go to God in prayer Father, we thank you for all that you've given us because we know that what we have is yours, not ours, but it is, we're just stewards of it, taking care of it while, while we have it here. We thank you for the blessings, for the answered prayers, for all that you do for us. And we pray, Father, as, as we give back a portion of which you have given us, that you'll do great things with these funds and that your son's name will be proclaimed throughout this community and around the world. We always do this and pray a prayer to your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our next song, 453. 453, Love Lifted Me. sing verses 1 and 3 of this song. Sing. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard not a sparing cry, and from the
subject this morning. At least it's tough for me sometimes. I'm uh, going to be talking about correction or being corrected. What does it mean to be corrected? I know I need it sometimes. We all do because we can all be wrong. And I'm going to get into that here in just a second. Before I get into the lesson, though, I would like to ask for your prayers. I know we've had several prayer requests already, but Pam's dad is in the last bit of stage four kidney failure, almost stage five, and uh, he is uh, hoping to get a kidney, basically. Uh, and be able to to improve his situation so i do ask for your prayers on his behalf again that's pam's dad his name is marty glenn if you wanted to know his name i appreciate that very much and pam does too so as we talk about being corrected see we've got a little test score up there what's the point of being tested if not to figure out how you're doing and when you see wrong answers do you ignore them and say well I'm not wrong the test is wrong you know maybe we do sometimes we do that when we take tests and evaluate things and we can never take the blame uh, to be corrected and that's hard because 
that's sort of the whole Christian life is to learn to change, to learn to be corrected, to do things God's way and not my way. And if I'm never wrong and if I never say and do and act in any way that needs to be corrected, how can I be better? How can I learn? How can I grow? Again, it's a tough subject. We've talked about it some in other instances, but never specifically a lesson on correction. But without change, everything remains the same in our life. Uh, we're getting into the end of the year, and as the end of the year wraps up, we maybe evaluate. I know we're just in middle of October. I'm not trying to rush the year. But as we start getting into winter, it sort of seems natural. What do I want next year to look like? What do I want my life to be next year if, Lord willing, I live it? Again, that's a correction. You know, for me to plan my own future and then for me to play, say, God willing, Lord willing, I'll have next year. Because I don't know my future. None of us do on this earth or how long we will live on this earth. Change is a big deal. And... I don't know if you guys, probably most everybody in this audience have seen the movie Groundhog's Day, Groundhog Day, whatever, and, and you know, he goes throughout the same day. And the whole point of the movie is for him to change his ways, change his attitude, change his life, become different than he was. Obviously, it's a made-up movie, but you know, he has days and days and days, and then he finally starts changing, and he starts helping people, and he starts doing good, instead of thinking only about himself constantly, and what can I get out of this day, but what can I do about this day? And if we live the same, then nothing will ever change, but if we change, everything can change. That's real life. We don't live the same day over and over and over. In a way, though, we sort of do. If we just go every day in a mundane way and we can only accomplish the tasks that we set for ourselves, what is different about your life than it was 10 years ago? You've aged. You've gotten older and the people around you have gotten older. But your view, their, your values, your perception maybe hasn't changed at all if you don't think any different than you did 10 years ago. So God asks you to be better than that. God asks you to grow, to develop, to listen to Him and to do things His way. Because after all, He's in control and in the end, He's got to say. And if we want to be better, we listen to Him, not do things the way we think and the way we reason and the way we ration. That's your control, though. In that sort of synopsis is what we have control over, our own attitude. What are we going to do about it? We can't change the day. We can't change the time. We can't change our life. We can't change where we were born, but we can change who we become and whose we become. And that's all God asks us to do is to become his child, to do things his way. Not because you can't do anything good on your own, but because he is good. And we can't know good without him because he gives us that. Anything we do that we call good is of God. Anything that we do on our own or selfishly is not. Are you willing to change? Are you willing to admit you need to change? Are you willing to be corrected? So that's what we're going to talk about today. I've mentioned before, you know, maybe about circumstances and people that, uh, that struggle changing. There's a specific person that uh, I no longer really have much contact with. But once upon a time... I had a big part in his life, and he mine, and uh, he had a tough time with change. He had a tough time with correction, and he had a tough time admitting he was wrong. Anything he ever did was always someone else's fault, and if you ever pointed out to him, he was smart enough to be able to turn it around and make it your fault, make it his sibling's fault, make it his parents' fault, make it his friend's fault, never his 
And when we have that attitude, we will never be better because we were never wrong in our own mind. And that's the kind of wisdom that the world gives you that's foolishness with God, I believe. And the Bible talks about that kind of wisdom. And I believe he could rationalize his way out of any situation if you just give him five minutes to explain himself. And so tomorrow is going to be the same and the next day and 10 years from now in his life. If he, if we don't understand, we can be wrong and we need to work on that. As we teach our children, we try to correct them. Funny enough, we had that conversation this morning. Literally this morning on the car ride, we talked about being corrected and accepting correction. It's hard growing up. It is hard letting go of what you think and how you feel. Because God does give us such intelligence that we can think through just about anything and take the blame off ourselves. Admitting our own fault is much harder than pointing the finger at somebody else. It takes much more humility and bigness. You know, we talk about uh, being a real fill in the blank, real man, a real whatever, a real woman, uh, an adult. We talk about all these things in terms that we want as children to grow up. We want the freedom without the responsibility. We want the freedom without the consequence. We want the salvation without the sacrifice. And the same thing is true with God. We want Jesus to save us, but we don't want to do things God's way. And it's all part of the package. You cannot separate the Savior from the Lord. He is the Lord and Savior. If you call him Lord and do not his will, then how are you his servant? And how are you saved through him, through his way, if he is not Lord? We talk about our Lord like people talked about their king in olden days and even modern day. If you have a king, a Lord over you, what do you do? You do what he tells you to do, right? You're his servant. You're his subordinate. And that's the way we need to think of Jesus except to a much bigger degree because he's not a person only. He's God. And he never made a mistake. He will never lead you in the wrong way. He'll never tell you the wrong thing to do. So, we can look at our mistakes as proof that we're trying. You know? Mistake without an S. Mistake are <laughs> proof that you are trying. Mistakes, if you are willing to accept your mistakes, shows that you tried and you messed up. And that's okay if you admit that. Here's another one. Don't waste a good mistake. Learn from it. So... If we don't learn from it, then we just messed up and we're just bound to do it again. You know, it's like it's like the old adage, uh, well, I don't want to learn history because that's the way they lived back then. I don't want to live like them. But if you don't learn from history, then you're bound to repeat it. You take history out of all of your courses that you learn, and we're going to probably mess up in the same way our ancestors did because we're people. Learn from other people's mistakes. Don't, you don't have to make them yourself. But when you do, don't waste a good mistake. Learn from it. Do better next time. All right, so as we're talking about correction, here's some scriptures you might want to jot down. Proverbs 12, verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. Do you love discipline? Nah, it's hard to love discipline, but if you really want to be better, then you appreciate discipline because it helps you to grow. It helps you to be better. That's what the Bible says there in Proverbs 12.1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. 
but he who hates reproof is stupid. We don't really like using that word in our household, calling someone stupid. But uh, in this translation, at least, if you hate discipline and you hate reproof, then that's not a good mentality to have. OK, that's ignorant. Hebrews 12, verse 11, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Isn't that so true? When we are being disciplined, it's painful. It hurts. It hurts our feelings. It hurts our attitude. And this is in Hebrews chapter 12. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Let's keep reading. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. If you actually listen to it, if you actually learn from it, if you let your discipline work on you then it will yield something so much better than the pain that you experienced while you were being disciplined. You can grow from it. You can learn from it. Don't, don't do it ignorantly and think you can't mess up. Learn from your mistakes. Of course, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The whole Bible is scripture. And all of it is given to us so that we can learn from it. Why do we have the Old Testament? To learn from it. To learn how we got here. To learn what God did to give us where we are right now. To, to make us where we are right now. And it's profitable for teaching. For reproof. For correction. And for training in righteousness. Every scripture has a purpose. If you apply it. If you don't apply it, then it's not doing you any good. It's just words on a page. Because you're not willing to do anything about it, to live by it, to learn from it. You're just reading, reading a book. Well, man, that's a good principle for somebody. You know, if we say that, then we're never taking that on ourselves. We just want them to hear it and them to hear it. Never me. Man, that was such a good lesson, preacher. I really wish my cousin were here to hear that. You know, we say that kind of stuff all the time. I say that kind of stuff. I want certain people to hear certain lessons. Man, they needed that. What about me? Did I need that? Can I point the finger back at myself and realize that I need correction too? Proverbs 9, 7 through 9. Whoever corrects a scoffer, and this is the one that was read to us a minute ago. Thank you for that reading. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. Whoever reproves a wicked man incurs injury. So if you're if if you if you're a ruffian, if you're a hooligan, whatever you want to call it, and you correct that person, what are they going to do to you? Well, they might beat you up. They might scream at you. That's what it's talking about. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. Because a scoffer doesn't want correction. Whoever reproves a wicked man, do you want to be known as a wicked man or a wicked woman? Neither do I. But if you go to a wicked person and reprove them, then you might incur injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Now listen to this, though. This is Proverbs 9, 7 through, uh, 7 through 9. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Wow. I needed that, brother. You know, it's hard to hear coming from you, but I know that you are coming from a place of love. And so I take that criticism and I'll try to fix what I need to fix. Now, sometimes people just get, you know, like correcting anything. I had a person tell me one time, uh, you were up there saying you were leading the first, you were leading the opening prayer, but it was not the opening prayer. It was just the first prayer because we had already opened services. Oh, okay. All right. So I tried to stop saying opening prayer and started calling it the first prayer. Was that needed? Don't think so. But I tried to take it and whatever. You know, if that makes that person happy. That wasn't here, by the way. That wasn't here. 
No one has said that to me here. And if you do, that's okay. Um, sometimes we like things said in a certain way. And that's okay too. But, but if we are willing to accept even mundane correction that maybe isn't always needed, then we're hopefully going to accept a good correction that we really need. Not stress over it, not worry about it, but take it and learn from it, grow from it, take what we can, get rid of the rest. You know, not every correction is exactly what we need to hear. Some people just like correcting people. Okay, well, take the good from whatever they said. What, maybe the good is only in their correction that they were thinking about you. And maybe that's the good that you can take from it. And their correction is all wrong. When you evaluate what God says, maybe their correction's wrong. But at least you know they were thinking about you. And maybe that's what you can take and put in your pocket. And the rest of it maybe is, is not needed. But take what you can, accept it, be humble about it, and move on. You know, the best you can. Sometimes we need to correct them in the same way, in love. But it says here, reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will still be wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. Wow, what good advice from Proverbs chapter 9 there. So we're going to go through these points rather quickly. Don't worry. Do you take correction? So I'm going to use some, some biblical examples here of how they took correction. And the first one is Pharaoh. So we're going to use some biblical examples to look at how these Bible characters, people, sometimes we say character and it makes it seem like it's, it's not a real story. These Bible people, how they took correction. All right. In Exodus chapter nine, if you want to open there, look at what Pharaoh did with Moses and Aaron, starting in verse 27. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, this time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right. Did you remember Pharaoh saying that? And I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord there, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Do you remember Pharaoh having this kind of attitude? You know, we paint a broad stroke sometimes, and we forget the details of the story. But at the beginning as of our reading here, Pharaoh accepted his wrong. Now, whether he meant it or not, I don't know his heart. But from the words read, from what he said, he accepted that he had sinned, that the Lord was right, that he and his people are wrong. Sometimes you can't even get someone to do that. Just to say that they were wrong, to utter those words. You know, and that's why we have so many memes, so many uh, funny stories about a husband or a wife. What you said you were wrong, can you repeat that? Can I record you saying that? Because I've never heard you say those words before. You were wrong, I was right. Well, that's what Pharaoh just did right here. But then, what did he do? Plead with the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hell. Sometimes when it's raining on us, when it's storming, we want relentment. We want, please back off. Okay, I'll fix it. I'll, you maybe pray to God. God, and you give him some kind of box. If you do this now, then I'll do this later. If you fix this storm that I'm in right now, then I'll be better later. I won't ever do this again. Do you hold up to that promise you gave to God? Or is it a moment of weakness that after it stops raining, you say, oh, now, now everything's better. I don't have to hold up to that. Well, that's what Pharaoh did. Okay. So Moses said to him, as soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hail so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. Go on to verse 34. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and the thunder had ceased, what did he do? He sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. You threw it all away, Pharaoh. You had it right. If you'd have just stayed with those opening statements, you could have fixed it. 
and everything would have been better. But you turn back again and you harden your heart and you changed your mind. That kind of correction is often what we do as people. We change our mind when things get better. You know what? Never mind all that stuff I said. I was in a moment of weakness. I don't actually feel that way. Now I've got clarity. I didn't actually mess up to begin with. You messed up. And I'm going to do what I need to do to fix the situation myself. And that's what we say. And we harden back up. And that's what Pharaoh did. So do you, do you take correction like Pharaoh? Do you take correction like Jonah? Jonah chapter 1, starting off the book. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, Amit Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid for the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Can we flee God's presence? No way. There's no hiding place that can consume us. That It's not like if we get in a lead box, he can't see us. It's not like if we get on a ship, he can't see us. Well, if I go 30 feet underwater, God won't... God won't see me there. I can do whatever I want. If I get in this dark corner, if I go to this place, if I leave the city, if I leave, you can't hide from God. No matter how hard you try, he sees you everywhere you go. He made everything you're hiding in. You can't hide from him. Don't fool yourself. Don't use the world's wisdom to think that you can get away like that. And Jonah, in his mind, I think he didn't want the people of Nineveh to hear God's word because, you know, I know God is a forgiving God. And these people are going to hear this lesson and they're going to change. And they're evil. They're wrong. They're bad. I don't want them to change. I want them to suffer. You ever think that way? They deserve what they're getting. Well, God's the judge, not me. So let him take care of that. If God tells me to go and preach, go and preach. If, if, if our job as Christians is to love God and love others, love God and love others. Let God take care of the rest. That doesn't mean we don't ever defend his word. That doesn't mean we don't ever need to do some other kind of defense. But in the end, God is the judge. Sometimes there is such a thing as tough love. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that, but it's still love. Love God, love your neighbor. Do his will, tell others about him. Do you correction, take correction like Jonah? You cannot hide from God. You cannot run from God. You cannot change what God tells you to do just because you might disagree. Which one of you is wrong? You know, if you disagree with God, are you, are you wrong or is God wrong? Well, I'm wrong. Okay. Do you take correction like Stephen's audience? This is a tough one. Acts chapter 7. Turn there with me. Starting in verse 54. Now when they had heard these things, they were enraged. They were angry. And they ground their teeth at him. Have you ever been so mad? You just, you just chew on your teeth. You just grind your teeth in anger. You ball up your fists. Okay, that was their state in this moment. They were so mad at what Stephen was saying. But he, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Verse 58. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. You maybe have heard this story before. If you haven't, go back and read what Stephen told them. And he goes through so much, so much information. But they couldn't hear it. They couldn't think about what he said. How dare you? And they killed him. That's how they took correction. That's how they took reproof or whatever you want to call it. 
They didn't learn from it. They didn't grow from it. At least in that moment, they killed it. Do you take correction like Stephen's audience? If you disagree with me, you must be wrong. And you must be dealt with now. And I'm going to do the dealing. Or I'll hold the coats while everybody else does it. How do you take correction? Do you take correction like Stephen's audience? Do you take correction like Adam and Eve? We've been studying in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. And he said, who told you you were naked? God's talking here. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you not eat, should not eat? Then the man said, um, the woman you gave me to be with, uh, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And so God changed his view and the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And so then God dealt with the serpent, but they all got dealt with. And it, you can imagine this story as if a parent is talking to their children. What did you just do? Well, my brother told me to do it. What did you just do? Well, my friend down the street gave it to me. Well, what did you do? You know, we keep pointing the fingers so we don't have blame, but ultimately they all had correction from God. They all had punishment from God. We can't point our way away from ourselves and expect to never have repercussions for what we've done. Those are called consequences. And we can be, we can be sinners and we can be forgiven and still have consequences. We can have scars. In fact, it's pretty much guaranteed. You sin, you're going to have consequences. Even though you can be forgiven of those things. Your memory doesn't forget. God, God can forget. But our memory holds on to the sins we've committed sometimes way too long. And we let that bury us and control our life because we know we committed that sin and we messed up. But if you've prayed about it and you've been forgiven and you've dealt with it, move on. Don't let those sins harm you to where you don't live for God in the future, to where you don't do what you need to do in the future. But you can still have scars. They just won't go away sometimes. I know I have sin in my life from years ago that just pop up sometimes in my head and that I get feel guilty for all over again. Those are consequences. Those are scars. People that I affected in the past, it pops back up sometimes. That's sin. So again, learn from other people's mistakes. Learn from my mistakes. You don't have to commit those sins yourself to learn from them, to be better. Because you can have scars too, and I don't want you to have scars. I want you to not do it in the first place. But when you do... Take correction the way you should. Learn from it. Grow from it. Don't take correction like Adam and Eve. Point the finger to everybody else. And lastly, do you take correction like the Jews on Pentecost? Jesus had already been killed. They had already done this horrible deed. But it's never too late if you have a breath in you. It's never too late to turn back to God. As long as you're still breathing, you still have a choice. You still have an opportunity to repent, turn away from where you were going and walk in the opposite direction. That's repentance. Listen here, Acts 2 verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. Wow. I mean, pointed statement right there in your face. Yeah, you did this. Now, when they heard this, they could have dealt with it like all these other characters we've looked at. But what did they do? They heard this. They were cut to the heart. I mean, just like, wow, total humility. I realized this was a horrible thing we've done. It pricked them. It cut them to the heart, to the quick of the heart. They really felt it. 
And so, because they felt it, they were willing to change. They were willing to turn away and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Help us fix this if there is any way. We can't bring Christ back, but we can repent. We can turn away. We can try to change and be better tomorrow. Be better today than we were yesterday. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They heard the correction, but they dealt with it differently. They accepted it and they changed themselves. Instead of pointing the finger, well, the Romans, well, my friend said Jesus wasn't the Christ. Well, yeah, I saw him do miracles, but I thought we were waiting on a different kind of savior. I thought we were waiting on the king of kings that would set up an earthly kingdom and save Israel from these Romans. I thought, I thought it was going to be different. I didn't think he really was the Christ or I wouldn't have killed him. Don't you understand? I wasn't wrong. I was misinformed. But that's not the way they handled it. They took the criticism, they took the correction, and they said, what can we do about it? How can we, can we fix this? And he told them exactly what to do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. That never before was able to happen. They could push their sins back as Jews, but they could never have forgiveness. And we can have the same thing. We can be forgiven, not for a short time, not for a year, forever. We can be forgiven. No one else can give you that. I can't give it to you. No other person can give it to you. There is no other God before God. The only God, capital G, God. Uh, it was commented that on our Bible class, the, the subtitles were not using capitals. Well, that's true, but Apologet Express didn't make those subtitles. Pretty sure that was just closed captioning that was automatically coming up. Just so you know, I don't think Apologet Express would have not capitalized God's name as the one true God. So the question comes to us. What are we going to do about it? Is there anything in our life we need forgiveness for in a public manner? Maybe you need it in a private manner. You need to handle that yourself. Deal with that yourself as you need to. But if in a public manner you need to repent, if you need to come forward and ask for prayers, if you want us to pray on your behalf, if you want to become a Christian this morning and be baptized for forgiveness of your sins, we can do that. If we can help you in any way, won't you come while we sing together? Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see. Every heart he can tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Thank you, Chad, for that lesson. How do we take direction? Could I say, well, I wish my wife was here for that one. <laughs> Kim is sick, by the way. She was not uh, feeling well this morning, so that's where she's at this morning. <clears throat> How do
how do we take correction? I like that lesson. Very good. Thank you for that. And uh, I need that, I'm sure, more than she does. <coughs> Remember this evening, we got to our regular service at 6 o'clock this evening. We will celebrate our October birthdays due to our the way things were last week. Uh, we had our, our friends and family day. You can see our numbers on the board there. We did very good with that. We appreciate all the efforts that went into that.